Welcome back to the Trading Desk. Uh, again, we're back uh, doing another interview today. I'm here with Matt Orr, Professor of Biology at OSU Cascades campus. And uh, Matt, we've been friends for a long time and we've talked about a, a number of different subjects and the economy, local, national. Uh, again, your dad was an economics professor, so you've got a little history, although you're not a student of economics yourself, you understand it quite a bit growing up with that in your, in your house. So let me just ask you a couple things. Where do you think we are in the, you know, in the overall economy? How is that affecting you and, and your students at uh, the university right now? Are you seeing changes? Uh, and let's talk about some things you want to talk about. Okay, well, um, <clears throat> let's see. I guess uh, from my perspective in terms of thinking about the overall economy, um, uh, I'd actually like to tie it into something that was going on on Monday, which was a, um, a giant uh, act of civil disobedience at a um, coal-fired power plant in Washington, D.C. Okay. And uh, one of the people that spearheaded that was James Hansen, who's uh, uh, NASA's chief climate scientist. And um, so at this point, um, I'm, I think one of the reasons I wanted to come on the show is to remind you and your listeners that the human economy is actually nested within a much larger system, mm -hmm. which is the Earth, uh, natural systems that the human economy depends on. Mm -hmm. And right now, um, a lot of those systems are under fairly severe stress. So uh, <clears throat> what happened? I, 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 I'm totally ignorant to what happened in DC, so why don't you give us a little, um, little background? Okay, an, an organization it has a website. It's actually worth checking out their website called 350.org. I've read that. Um, <laughs> set up this, uh, uh, in part spearheaded by a guy named Bill McKibben, who was one of the first authors to write about the eventual impacts of climate change. Mm -hmm. um, their concern is, and, and it's, it's now become a, a fairly central concern throughout the scientific community, is that we don't really have a lot of time left to get our, our energy situation right. Um, so the amount of certainty there is in terms of what humans are doing to the planet with, with fossil fuel emissions is, is very high right now. So the 2007 IPCC report, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is a, an international body of primary researchers in, this, in climate science, 2007 uh, unequivocally stated that the temperatures of the Earth are rising, and there's a 90% certainty that the humans are, humans are the primary cause, mm -hmm. the main cause. So now, so now that we've seen, uh, you know, we've got this crisis, uh, I, I think you could argue it both ways. I'm not going to get into that argument. But you've got a crisis of uh, natural resources clearly out there. Uh, you know, we do have defined resources. Oil has gone from $150 a barrel down to the high 30s again. It's going to go off people's radars again, mm -hmm. right? Would yeah, you agree with so. that? Yeah, and also if you want to fit this into the context of current economic problems, um, there's, there's pluses and minuses there. Um, you know, with the economy down, people aren't consuming as much. There's not as much stress put on both the climate, other um, aspects of natural resources. However, there are fewer resources available to address some of these problems, like make transition, transitions to alternative mm -hmm. forms of energy that right. would be uh, more climate friendly. What do you think some of those sources uh, for our viewers that, you know, would, you know, that they could look into and explore? You know, what, what do you think are areas that are going to have the potential to grow that you think make sense? Is it wind? Is it solar? You know, what is going to replace? Is it battery power that's going to replace the, the, the dependence on fossil fuels? And There will be no one technology that does it, at least in the short term. Mm -hmm. And by short term, I'm talking maybe 100 years, probably much longer, probably never. Mm -hmm. We will never have another bonanza like we've enjoyed right. with underground, you know, these, these reserves of Fossil fuels have built up over millions of years. We've basically mined most of them out. Um, and um, once they're gone, they're gone. But I'd also like to reemphasize that what um, most of the mainstream cli climate scientists are saying now is we actually can't afford to keep burning even the ones that are left. Um, and so just, just a quick, this is a quote out of um, Jim Hansen. Again, he's NASA's chief uh, climate scientist. This is a recent paper that he published in collaboration with some scientists from um, Columbia University, uh, Wesleyan University, University of California at Santa Cruz. Um, they were saying that um, preservation of climate requires that most remaining fossil fuel carbon is never emitted to the atmosphere. Um, 
And uh, they also said humanity's task of moderating human-caused global climate change is urgent. Um, the time available uh, to reduce this uh, is uncertain. Some people think we're already past the mm -hmm. point of no return. Um, but I think most people feel like we still have a chance to act. That yeah. window is really closing, though. I mean, uh, not to be apocalyptic, but do you think it's in our lifetime, our children's lifetime, our grandchildren's, um, that you see this type of strain really coming? You know, because I, I, I don't disagree with you. I mean, I think it's real and I think it's out there. And, and well, I'd like to think that it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. There's still, I, st I think that there is still time to make some significant dents in the problem. And I think, you know, Hanson would probably agree with that. The thing is, we don't have a lot of time right now. Right. There's pretty much consensus across the board within the scientific community on that. Right. Um, what, so what do I mean by that? What do we Maybe need to a five-year window. What do we need to do? Um, that's, so this was um, the head of the IPCC, again, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is back in 2005. He stated, we have a 10-year window to begin to make very deep cuts mm -hmm. in our carbon fuel use if, and this is his quote, if humanity is to survive. Now, um, I, don't, I think by humanity there, I think what he means is, is sort of the culture as we know it. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the sort of, so. Um, you know, so he, the excesses that we've been living on, obviously, and the numbers of people that are living on this planet put a big strain on, on all of us. Uh, in the way yeah. we're consuming. I mean, we, we can't continue to add on the Chinese, the Indians, where populations are, you know, tenfold. Population is certainly a big part of it. Um, but I think, you know, if I, if I had to point to one thing right now, and, and it goes back to this, this whole protest at this coal-fired power plant in D.C., I think political inertia, mm -hmm. and a lot of the, the centralized interest. So fossil fuel is also a very centralized form, to put it in economic terms. It's a real centralized form of providing energy for people. Mm -hmm. And so, so you get big companies who can put out the infrastructure to mine these fossil fuels out of the ground, right. sell them off to people. You've got to keep paying for it, right? If you put a solar energy cell on your rooftop, then suddenly you're not paying you know, a centralized source for your energy. Right. And so there's been a lot of um, obstruction from these big centralized sources of energy that pr providing fossil fuels to people um, you know, they've got a lot of money. Yeah, a lot of lobbyists. A lot of, a lot of power, yeah, a lot of same. lobbyists. And so and again, it's really a lot of political big inertia. Government, again, being, big government being, uh, instead of being reactive and, and, and allowing these types of entities to continue, why not be proactive? And then we've we were talking about this in an earlier uh, topic on the show today, where why not consider these things before we get to the end of our rope? And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to cut you off here, but uh, I agree with you, and I'd like to see some more you know, policies uh, uh, being proactive versus, you know, again, defending the uh, terms and the policies of, of the large nationalized entities, and, and they're not just U.S.-based. When we come back to the trading desk, we're, we'll be back with uh, more topics on uh, the local and regional markets, and finally, our fantasy finance section.